Well, welcome to DevConf here in Cambridge. I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado, and I work for HP Enterprise. My name is Betty Dahl, and HP Enterprise is now the fifth company that I've merged and acquired myself into. I started at Bell Labs, then I worked at Unix System Laboratories, then Novell, and then HP, and now HP Enterprise. And actually, my years of service go all the way back to when I graduated from college. And this year, I celebrated my 30th anniversary at HP. <laughs> so, right now, my job is to work on Linux for the machine as a kernel developer. And I'm part of a team that's led by Keith Packard. And I think that name might be familiar to you here in the Debian community. At HPE, Keith is quite the evangelist for Debian. And in fact, I thought you would all be interested in hearing about the machine because it's going to run Debian. Um, I borrowed these slides from Keith with his permission. Keith was invited to give a keynote speech at the LinuxCon in Seattle, Washington this August. Were any of you there? No? Oh, you were. Excellent. So you might hear a little repeat, but it's all new. Keith, Keith's talk was very well received. So when I had the opportunity to present here at the mini DebConf, I quickly called him up and got his permission to reuse his slides. Now at the bottom, you'll notice that I have this little caveat. The information contained herein is subject to change without notice. And that's because we're working on a research project. And everything is up in the air. And we're making great progress and forward leaps and bounds. And we're happily changing things. We're not locked down yet. So that's why we have that little caveat there. Today I'm going to talk about the machine, which is a culmination of various parts of HP Labs research and combined into a new computer architecture. So I'm going to cover the hardware and the software. I like to think of it at two levels. The first is the conceptual, pure c computer architecture. And the second is the baby steps that we're taking to actually implement it. Now, being engineers, I'm sure you're all going to be asking me the detailed questions about what's actually in the registers. And so I'm, I'm asking you up front to try and focus more on the conceptual level, because as I said just a moment ago, all those details of what's actually being built are constantly changing. We talk about three elements, the electrons, the photons, and the ions. On the electron side, we've got silicon running in a huge pile of SOCs. Um, as interest to our ARM DebConf, the current implementation has an ARM SOC. So the machine is going to have like 80 SOCs um, in each in, a, in a, one in each node in a huge rack. And that's going to be the special purpose SOC of the electron side. On the other side, you have ions. So we have HP researchers that have invented something called the MemRister. Have anybody heard of that? Yeah, it's pretty cool technology. And I want to put a plug in for a 12-part lecture series called the Chua Lecture Series. If you Google that, you'll see it. It's a 12-part lecture sponsored by HP, given by Leon Chua, who's a professor at Berkeley. And he's explaining everything about MemRisters and the chaos that that's going to cause in the computer industry. It's free. You just can Google it and watch it on YouTube. They're really interesting. I'm not a MemRister 
uh, expert. I've been trying to follow the Chua series myself. But the key point about the massive memory pool is that it's non-volatile. So instead of having to worry about disks and I.O., everything you can think of is going to fit in this massive memory pool. And that's the thing that boggles my mind, and it's the concept that's most important for you to walk away from in this talk, is what are you going to do when everything you can possibly imagine fits in memory, and you don't have to worry about getting it from disk or paging it or moving it around. So that's the purpose of the machine, is to stop worrying about moving data and actually get working on the data. Oops, wrong way. I have a little animation here. So the machine is dense. We have in a 5U unit or, or, or box enclosure, there's going to be 10 nodes. Each node has 4 terabytes. So there's 40 terabytes in 5U. Now compare that to our best selling Superdome X at HP. That's 18 units and it has 12 terabytes maximum. So we've really increased the density of compute. And this is just our first prototype, right? So you take that and we're planning to build um, a rack that has eight of those. So we're going to have 80 nodes, each with four terabytes. That's 320 terabytes in a rack. And then we talk about warehouse scale. We're going to fill an entire room with these boxes and link them together with the photonics. So each of those racks has 320 terabytes. You can see how quickly that expands upward. Now the machined architecture is also going to be thought of to go smaller, like think down to your phone. So what if you had a terabyte in your phone? That would be pretty cool. So they're all linked together with the photonics and networking too. The density is the key point in this slide. Let's see, a little more animation. All right, so this is the conceptual schematic for a node. And I wanted to point out a, a few things on this slide. First is that there's two PCAs. One on the right is the um, memory, and the one on the left is the SOC. They're powered separately. They're separate power rails, and there's a management controller to tr control the power. So what's cool about that is that if Linux on the SOC fails and is shut down, the next generation memory is still active, and other nodes can be act actively accessing it, and vice versa. Um, so when we talk about the SOC side, we have an SOC, which in this case, in the first instance, will be an arm. But it's just like a Lego plug, too. We can put in a special purpose ASIC. We can put in an Intel SOC or, or whatever like we would like. There's DRAM there on the SOC, so just regular memory, probably about a terabyte. There's two. Uh, RDMA capable network ports because we have to get data in and out of this big machine. And then there's a management port and a management processor that, that again is controlling the power, reporting errors, and coordinating with the other nodes. On the other side is the non volatile memory. Right now they're implemented as FPGAs and the optics are connected to the uh, next generation memory interface on the SOC. A key point about the NVM is that 
it's hardware firewall protected. So it's encrypted in place, and each um, eight gigabyte chunk is access controlled to the uh, application or node that has been allocated that chunk of memory. Oh, I went the wrong way again. <laughs> okay, so this is a key slide and I'm hoping that everybody gets the concept in here. We've got conceptual diagrams of the, the node assembly we just looked at. In fact, there's three of them here. The universal memory <laughs> is that NVM memory across each of the nodes. But instead of thinking it as, as we normally think of it, we have to pool it into one giant pool. Um, this next animation will show that. So when we looked at the pictures of the actual hardware and the enclosures and racks, you you still think of it as, oh, that's sort of like a superdome, or that's sort of like the machines I have in my data center. But this is the big difference. Instead of the memory being associated just with one SOC, you treat it as a huge pool, and any node can byte address any memory byte on any other node. So this little picture shows how you go through this next generation memory intercorrect bridge, through the photonics and into another node's memory, and that's all by addressable. All right. So we've got a lot of um, memory to talk about, and memory management is one of the big new areas for the machine. So we've never had to deal with 320 terabytes of memory before. In fact, that doesn't actually fit in the physical address size for an ARM SOC. Well, we've got to do uh, mapping from the physical address in the SOC to what we're calling the logical Z address. That's just the logical address on this next generation memory interconnect. And we divide the memory into uh, books and booklets. I think it's a play on pages in, in the previous generation. Um, so a book is eight gigabytes, and that's the normal chunk of memory that you're gonna get. Seems like a lot, so we decided there, there might be a need for booklets, which are 64K. I mentioned already there's hardware access control for each book. So each gigabyte chunk has a firewall entry, which has a read bit and a write bit that allows uh, overarching control to say, oh, you're allowed to look at that address or you're not allowed. So since it's built into uh, hardware from the beginning. We're hoping that it's going to be super fast and security will be built into your data. So this is a chart that shows us the translation from a virtual address in the SOC that's 48 bits to the actual 75-bit uh, physical address on the next generation memory interconnect. So 75 bits can access 32 zeta bytes. That's what comes after petabytes. I wasn't really sure myself. <laughs> so that's, that's huge. We're not planning to build that one yet, but that's uh, probably enough bits. Well, that's what we said when we thought we, 48 was enough, right? So, 48, who would ever need more than 256 terabytes of memory? Come on. <laughs> well, in the machine, that's what we're going for. 
So we have a little bit of a problem in that we're, we're starting out with 320 terabytes. So what we need to do is map the uh, physical address to a logical Z address. And this is a computer science problem that's already been solved. And uh, you might recall there's something called apertures. They're like windows into memory. And you can switch which window you're looking at um, dynamically. So that's how we plan to handle the uh, physical address to LZA mapping, which is going from uh, 44 bits probably to, or 48 bits to 53 bit addressing for the logical Z address. Logical Z address contains the in interleave group, the book number, and the booklet number. And then from that, you, you translate it into what goes across the NGMI. Uh, did I miss one? No. Okay. So now, that's what I have to say about the hardware. And I think I introduced myself as a software person, so I'm a little relieved that's done with. In software side, I think I started out telling you that we're actually going to run Linux, Debian. And we have a repo. I, I don't know if you've heard of the H Linux repo that runs the Helion cloud at HP. That's the group that my group is associated with. So we're starting with that Debian repo, doing whatever we need to to make it uh, work on the machine. Our customers are the HP Labs researchers that are trying to write applications for the machine. And that's what I want you all to start thinking about is how, how would I use all this memory in an actual application? What would I need from the operating system? What services would I need to actually make use of this? There's five areas here that I'm going to go through. Um, global allocation, the local access to the fabric, non-coherent atomics, physical address remapping, and uh, direct access, byte addressable access. So we've got this huge pool of memory, 320 terabytes, spread across all the nodes. First thing we realized is we need an overarching control mechanism to take care of the books. So who else would take care of books but the librarian? So that's the name of our, our uh, software and that runs in what we call the top of rack server, which the top of rack server could be any computer, and it doesn't necessarily have access to the machine registers and Z addresses and all of that. Its, its purpose is, a, is memory management, really. So it knows about all of the nodes, all of the memory, what's been allocated, what's free, um, and it, when, you, when an application needs memory, say it wants, I don't know, 100 gig, <laughs> it just boggles me, <laughs> it will allocate um, in chunks of 8 gigabytes, that's our books, and, and put them on a shelf. And they can come from anywhere in the whole rack, from any node. Um, and that's what you see there as the shelves. We also recognize that not everybody needs 100 gig. Like if you're trying to run an ex a current app, the 64K booklet is probably more the chunk of size that you would want to get, say 100 of those. So um, the second level of allocation is done in the file system layer. And that one will give you uh, smaller chunks as booklets. You'll see we have an ext4 file system and also a new distributed file system, which is an area that we're researching. So once you've asked for that in the, as an application and the librarian has granted you a shelf, what it actually is doing is creating uh, some files in, in what we call the librarian file system. So on your 
Linux system, if you looked in slash LFS, you can create a file there using your new bookshelf. We really need file systems even though it's direct byte addressable. The issue is that it's non-volatile memory. So when you shut down your system and you come back up and you're restarting, you're going to want to find that same chunk of memory. So it needs to have essentially an inode, a name, a size, a length. So that's why we, we're using the file system concept, but it's very lightweight. Um, the librarian file system is not sparse, meaning that they're all still those eight gigabyte chunks. You can't like uh, have a hole in the middle, for example. When your application actually wants to get to the NVM, all you do is open a file in your bookshelf and slash LFS and then call memmap. And from there, you can use the standard tools to uh, access the memory. So I've talked a lot about the different pieces in this block diagram shows the fabric detached memory management. We, we talked about the top of rack management server. That's a separate computer where the librarian is running. Um, an identity manager is identifying the nodes, the applications, um, firewalls, things like that. Provisioning service on the top of rack service server is meant to make it super easy to install Linux for the machine on all 80 nodes. So, because that's a management headache, right? <laughs> so we have this idea of a provisioning service that they'll just boot up fresh versions really easily and quickly. So the librarian talks to Linux user space in each of the nodes using JSON across the uh, actual network. Um, there's three things in user space that are important to us. There's a firewall proxy. I already talked about how each book has a read-write bit to prevent uh, or to enforce security across the system. So the firewall proxy has to go into the node because it can talk to the firewall controller in the next generation memory interface, whereas the ne the top of rack server is just a generic computer. It can't talk to the NGMI. We're going to use the ARM trust zone capabilities too to help uh, work with the firewall controller. The second piece in user space is the librarian file systems proxy. So the librarian is up on that top of rack server telling you, telling Linux, oh, here's an eight gigabyte chunk of memory you can use. So the proxy receives that information is what actually does the uh, virtual, the physical to virtual mapping of that space that we've been given. The third thing is a, a user allocator. So that's going to talk to the librarian file system as well. So in the kernel itself, we're going to implement that aperture manager. That's the thing that controls remapping of the virtual address to different window of physical because we can't fit the whole thing in. Um, we've got the library and file system and that maps to a block device and then that goes down to the local file system or potentially a concurrent. We're going to use um, DAX, D-A-X, which is something that's already in Linux, it's direct access. It's a way to get around, it, you can use any existing file system, in this case ext4, and instead of going through all of the hardware paths, it directly accesses the memory. Um, this stuff already works and it's been submitted, I don't know, uh, maybe since last year. It's being driven by Intel because Intel's coming out with non-volatile uh, RAM DIMMs for their servers that are simply a, a plug-and-play to existing DIMM slots, except now they're non-volatile. 
So they have a, a goal of supporting those and using DAX to do that. So we want to reuse that same mechanism. Okay, so here's a big aha uh -huh too. The whole uh, memory pool is not coherent. So that's a big gotcha. It, it makes, we've, it, this happened in the past. Everything in computer science is cyclical. We've probably seen a lot of the problems more than once. So a long time ago, there was a choice point. Do we do coherent or not coherent? And at that time, it was chosen that hardware would take care of the co coherency problem. And any time you access something from any CPU, you would see the same picture of memory and cache flushes would happen automatically for you in hardware. And that was a fine decision, but the other choice is to have software take care of the cache flushing and do it in software. So at this point, with the scale of the hardware, we think that trying the other way, non-coherent, and doing the caching in software is reasonable. So we've got to have tools to do that, to know when to flush, when, how to flush, and to provide, uh, make it easy for applications to do that. One thing you always need is atomic operations. Um, things for, things like spin locks or uh, you, you want to know that when you do this operation and it returns, it's actually done and completed. So built into the NGMI are atomic operations that guarantee that when they're done, they're done. You don't have to worry about cache flushes. So um, this slide talks a little bit about there's four operations, the fetch and add, swap, compare and store, and read. And you'll see these in other atomic operations in other processor sets. We have different sizes for each of those, so it turns into this pretty big list of functions, but it's not, it's not anything hard to deal with. So that's called the FAM Atomic Library. That's another set of software that you'll see in user space for applications to use. Hopefully, It'll be used more by some kind of middleware, file systems, et cetera. And unless you're a super high performant machine app, you won't have to deal with those directly. But they do exist and they're important to get things correct. So we have physical address remapping. Um, I talked a little bit about this already with the Aperture Manager, getting the right window for your physical addresses into the, uh, the huge pool of memory. Um, one area that we have to work on is in DAX, which is already upstream, as I mentioned. So it doesn't handle remapping yet. So we'll have to work with the upstream community to um, allow remapping, which is something reasonable um, and shouldn't be a problem. We can, uh, well, I already talked about the apertures and, and how each physical chunk can be an aperture into real memory. Okay, so in cache management, we're also piggybacking on code that already exists. There's a new library called libpmem. P stands for persistent. And it's been driven by Intel, but it's an open source effort. It's already upstream. It's a user space library that lets you do direct access to non-volatile memory. Um, right now, you can use it on Intel's NVDIMMs. Um, but we're going to apply the same concepts to the machine, since it's non-volatile memory as well. So we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> there are some things we need to add. Um, there's a function called pmem is pmem, which seems silly, but um, it lets you know if the address you're doing, using is actually uh, persistent memory or if it's just pretending to be. <laughs> um, and then there's a function pmem needs invalidate, 
which means that it's dirty cash. You need to, to flush it. There's three functions, PMEM flush, PMEM drain, and PMEM has hardware drain. So say you're doing a bunch of writes, you can flush each one, and then at the end, when you really want it to be coherent, you do a drain. Um, and the function PMEM has hardware drain tells you if the hardware itself actually has that and it's worth calling. So it'd be something you would do up front in your application or your middleware. Say, do, does this platform need hardware drain? And then there's a cache invalidation function, PMEM invalidate. Um, so you can make sure things get flushed. So this gives you really fine level control over how your application will deal with the cache. Now, I bet none of you really ever wanted to deal with the cache in your application. <laughs> so that's why I keep harping on, we're hoping to have middleware and things that make it easy for applications to do this. So memory errors, and this is actually my field. I do RAS, um, I've worked on RAS and x86, things like um, the PCIe live error recovery and SRAR and that sort of thing. So I fell into helping with the non-volatile memory errors, which is really a different set of problems. Um, I call it the problem of persistent um, poison. <laughs> anyway, so in the machine, in non-volatile memory, the read errors are going to be singled, signaled synchronously, which means when you um, write, so, so this is all byte addressable. So basically you're, you're just saying A equals three, where the contents of A is actually in non-volatile memory on some node in that big pool of memory. That's all it takes to write to it, right? So if you're reading or you're saying, you know, a equals the contents of B. Um, when that contents have an actual error, which isn't supposed to happen, there's all kinds of hardware and software to prevent an error from happening, but someday it will. Um, what will happen is synchronously, before you return from that instruction, there will, the error will happen. It'll come in through an SEA into the ARM SOC, and, what we'll do is we'll call uh, SIGBUS to notify the application. So before that returns, you'll get an error notification. Writes, on the other hand, are more complex because they're asynchronous. So you can say the contents of A, set it to three, and that actually causes an error. You won't know about it until the, f the caches are flushed. So that's, that's the key is when you put in your drain functions, that's when you're going to get the errors on write. And it's the same process. It'll come through ARM with the uh, SEA, and then uh, we'll SIGBUS the application. So that's why the, the PMEM drain in your writes are important. You want to do them uh, proactively and anticipate that that's where your errors might come. So this picture shows all of the fabric connections. The, the SOCs are on the outside, and there we have those next generation memory interconnect switches, which attach to the fabric attached memory. Um, the, the point here is that there is a little bit of pneuma and reliability that you might get at if you could control precisely where in the fabric attached memory you wanted to allocate. Say you wanted to um, have two copies of your data, one on one node and one on another, so that if that node failed, you would still have a reliable copy. So that's one reason why you might want to allocate in a specific place. The other is NUMA. Now, in, in the conceptual machine architecture, the photonics are going to make it so fast to access 
the memory on the other side of the lab from your node that we're hoping NUMA is less of an issue. But there still is going to be a difference in latency, even if it's tiny compared to the latencies we see today. So my hope in the, in the concept of the, the machine is that you won't have to worry about it. But in the reality and in the baby steps we're taking towards building this thing the first time, there might be a difference in NUMA from you know, node A to a node in another rack. So that's a other point in this diagram. So what that leads to is a need for precise allocation. And so if you wanted to specifically allocate memory on a node, because it's your node maybe and you think it's the closest, or because it's not your node and you want to have a copy of data in a reliable different place, we want to provide um, extended attributes. In those attributes, the attribute we're providing is called interleave request. So the memory is um, grouped or interleaved. So for example, in a, the first instance of nodes, we plan to interleave all four terabytes across those four controllers. So you refer to memory as an interleave group. So you can request a specific interleave group when you're allocating memory for your application. So here's the areas that I wanted to call out as the places where my group in Linux for the machine will need to contribute upstream and to the uh, free software. The first is that libpmem. We talked about how uh, we'll need to allow for remapping of the physical to virtual address that libpmem doesn't do yet. We're also wanting to add that pmem drain and pmem invalidate functions that aren't there yet. The direct access, that DAX software, that uh, is an extension to every file system, or, or could be a, added onto every file system, is another area where we've been actively, HPE has been actively contributing. There's research that needs to be done into concurrent and distributed file systems. Um, this hasn't really started yet, but as you can see um, with the machine and the library file system, we need to handle uh, both of those aspects, concurrency and distrib. Um, then there's the non-coherent cache management we talked about, and my favorite is the RAS and large memory systems. Um, there's been some work in ARM RAS features, but it's nowhere near what's been done in uh, the, it, the Intel processors. So I've already got some patches in mind to add hooks so that we could recover from errors in the kernel. We can detect if its uh, memory errors are in kernel space, user space, or persistent memory space, those kinds of things. And that's the end of my talk. I have time for questions, I think, right? Thank you. So, any questions? Mm -hmm. oh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to see uh, lots of um, APIs being reused, extended, but were there any that you wish you could have thrown away and started again? Hmm. So the HP Labs researchers have implemented totally different libraries similar to libpmem. They essentially did the same thing, so we are in the process of convincing them that libpmem will meet their needs. There's other approaches to handling persistent memory and user space um, that are also being researched at HP Labs and other places such as Oracle's. 
And those are extensions to the C language itself um, or other computer languages. Those extensions are needed to do things like explicitly flushed memory bar barrier type operations within the language itself. And personally, in the long term, I think that that might be the way to solve the problem of having applications deal with this rather than have them call at the precise right time these library functions. So we are open to having research done or proposals of how to solve these problems better. And we're the productization group doing this Linux for the machine to make something that those HP Labs researchers can actually deploy and use right out of the box and do their research to come up with these grand new ways of thinking about things. But I hope that you all can do the same thing too, start thinking about, well, how should this really work? Does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, I think you skipped over the photonics bit a little bit. I'd, I'd like to know more about how that interconnect works. Okay. So I'm not a hardware person, and I don't really know a lot about the photonics. I sort of treat it as a black box. But what's important to me about that black box is that it's super fast, and um, the HP Labs researchers have done all kinds of work on making sure that it's um, a step forward from what we've implemented in our current Superdome X. HP is famous for its fabrics. Um, that's really one area that we excel at. So having that, they're the ones that are getting to start over, like you said, um, and create from scratch. What, what should the memory interconnect actually be? And I, I can't really speak to it. It's one of those things that now you know it exists. You can Google it, and I don't know how much is public. Um, yet. <laughs> it will be soon. Um, that's another topic I was having a conversation with at that, that Jul or November 5th party we had at Neil's house. Um, it was a good discussion with Andy about open source and shouldn't this all be open right now? And I, I told Andy, yes, it should. I'm an open source person and our leaders are all open source people as well. Like we've got Martin Michelmeyer, uh, B. Dale, uh, Martin Fink is our CTO. They're all espousing the machine as open source. And I, I don't know exactly how that will come to be, but it will. And it's part of our corporate mission now as, as HPE. Um, it's one of the big differences I hope to see is a more focus on open source. We have a whole group within the company dedicated to open source and evangelizing open source within the company. So it's a long way to say the specs probably not on Google yet, but it should be there soon and keep your eyes open for it. You're welcome. There's one there. Gloss over the non-uniformity of memory access as if it's a problem you think you can solve. But fundamentally, there doesn't seem to be any technology for faster than light communication on the horizon. Hmm. That's a statement, and I will agree with it. There is no faster than light communication. And... Uh, we're working with improving memory access latencies using uh, photonics. So actually, I have a question. I mean, sure. how big will one of these machines scale? How big will it scale? Yes. Well, we saw in that one picture, like a room full of them. The rack itself that we're initially building will have 80 nodes, 320 terabytes, and be in a single rack. 
we know we'll have optical connections from rack to rack, so you could buy as many of these as you want. Um, I don't have like specific product information. I'm not a marketing person. You don't want a marketing person here. <laughs> so I, I can't really speak to the precise numbers or size that a product might eventually um, scale to, but there's really no limit to it, right? And, and the interesting thing is that it can scale little too. Like it can scale to be your phone or to be in your refrigerator, you know, that sort of thing. Oh, um, at some point, will it be possible to sort of emulate this hardware just using like a storage area network? Like rather than use say DAX to sort of switch some component out and have it address um, a storage area network of just regular storage nodes, just to sort mm -hmm. of be be testing the the new software architecture, but just using existing hardware to emulate that. Right. You're a very clever man. That's what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> we're using uh, virtual machines to pretend they're nodes. We're using DAX with reserved memory on a big Superdome system to, to have a big pool of memory. We don't care that it's non-volatile when we're doing our development. Um, things like that we can simulate and we have working environments to, to play with these ideas. You could do the same. <laughs> okay, so I have another question. Sure. So uh, you, you're saying at the moment it's based on ARM SOCs, which is, yay, excellent. Yay. <laughs> it, it's, nice, it's nice when people use ARM stuff, it pays my salary. Good. <laughs> um, are you, is that actually the software architecture, the software instruction set that's going to be exposed, or is, this, or is it all going to be virtualized? Is it going to be a, a, some higher level, uh, more abstract um, instruction set or architecture exposed? Or is, is it all good, are you potentially going to have to port your software from one iteration of the machine to the next or something? Right, so our Linux for the machine is running the ARM64 architecture version of Debian. That doesn't necessarily expose the ARM instruction set to user space. Of course, you can do assembly code if you choose to, but we're not, we're not trying to expose the ARMness of the machine um, at the application level. And what we're really interested in this early research time is getting people to explore the ideas of how can an application be totally rewritten to make use of this huge pool of memory. And that shouldn't require knowledge of the processor's instruction set. So um, we're happy that it's ARM. We like, we've, we've been playing with different little ARM machines to learn ARM and the architecture. So. Um, I'm a Raspberry Pi person in my home life. I, I play with toys and uh, make little things out of Raspberry Pis. But yeah, I don't think that, getting back to your question, that it's necessary to expose at the Linux level. And that's the beauty of it, right? Like Linux is Linux, whether you're running on a Raspberry Pi or a, a Superdome X. Any other questions? I guess that's it. Thank you very much, Bessie. That was You're really welcome. interesting. Glad you liked it.